Hello everyone, welcome to 1.5 Degrees, the podcast where together we explore the science, solutions, and stories involved in the fight against climate change. I'm your host, Heidi Pan, speaking with the professionals behind the latest research, policies, culture, and innovations shaping our response to global environmental challenges. For today's episode, we are joined by Gary Cohen, who is the president and co-founder of Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health to discuss his transformative work in environmental health and resilience in the healthcare sector, the communities they serve, and more. Gary has been a pioneer in the environmental health movement for 38 years, building coalitions and networks globally to address the environmental health impacts related to toxic chemical exposure and climate change. In 2013, he was awarded the Champion of Change Award for Climate Change and Public Health by the White House, and in 2015, he was named a MacArthur Fellow and recipient of the Genius Grant from the MacArthur Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Gary. It's truly an honor. Nice to be here, Heidi. So we met at Climate Week NYC, but for for listeners, can you tell us more about what it is that you do with Healthcare Without Harm and Practice Green Health? Yeah, what uh, Healthcare Without Harm's commitment is to work with the healthcare sector to address its environmental footprint, to support their role as anchors uh, in building resilience in their communities in the face of climate crisis, and also to mobilize health care professionals as advocates for policy change to accelerate our transformation um, away from toxic chemicals and fossil fuels toward a more sustainable and just and healthy future. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the work that you do is really phenomenal, and I, I really can't wait to, to get into it. Um, but I mean, just to also, how did you come to be involved in the environmental health movement and what events or experiences, I guess, motivated you to start your organizations and dedicate your career to this cause? Yeah. I, um, I became involved after a union carbide pesticide factory blew up in a city called Bhopal in India. Um, And in one night, this factory exploded and killed thousands of people and injured a half a million others. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been called the Hiroshima of the chemical industry um, because of such devastation and death that it caused. And people in the United States said, well, God, we've got lots of chemical factories around our communities. Could that happen here? And I joined with others to um, advocate for the first uh, what's called national right to know law in this country um, in the mid-1980s, um, which basically guaranteed that if you lived in the community, you had the right to know about what mm-hmm. toxic chemicals were in the air being dumped by uh, companies, um, what were being dumped in your neighborhood and land and toxic dumps. Um, and what was being dumped in the water um, in order to protect your kids. So uh, that law uh, was passed in 1986, and it started to create some tools for communities uh, around protecting their children and the integrity of their communities um, from these toxic chemical threats. And about 10 years later, I were learning in that work that the way that we were thinking about chemicals was was not accurate and that the most vulnerable people to chemicals were actually uh, the child in the womb and the first thousand days of life and that there wasn't a real safe dose of chemical mm-hmm. exposure for those people, um, um, small people. And, um, and the chemicals that we were learning about, one was dioxin, and that was the result of burning plastics, uh, like PVC plastics, mm-hmm. or producing pesticides or plastics. Um, so it was a byproduct. Um, and the other chemical that was a kind of a poster child for this kind of early dose exposure was mercury. And um, because it, deve- it it impacts the developing brains of children and could lower their IQ and create mm-hmm. uh, learning disabilities, et cetera. Um, and so at the very same time as this new science was coming out, we learned that um, medical waste incinerators were the largest source of dioxin emissions in the country. So the healthcare sector yeah. was the largest source of this cancer-causing chemical exposure and also a significant source of mercury because millions and millions of broken mercury thermometers were winding up 
in the environment and into the fish and into the fish that we ate. So um, many of us got together and we said, look, what hope do we have for creating healthy communities and having healthy people that are free from some of these chronic diseases if the very sector of our economy that has healing as its mission is itself a major polluter? And so we started Healthcare Without Harm because we realized that that those in the health sector had no knowledge of environmental health issues. They didn't understand chemicals and health. They didn't understand climate and health. They didn't understand food systems and health or buildings and health. And so we said, we need to bring this sector into awareness around this and clean up their own act. Um, they're almost 20% of the economy in the United States and 10% globally. Uh, and it's the one sector that lives within this uh, ethical framework, this Hippocratic Oath to first do no harm. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, okay, if we work with this, with hospitals around the world, we can get them to model a transformation away from their reliance on, on toxic chemicals, fossil fuels, and actually industrial agriculture, which we see as the root causes for not only the climate crisis, but um, root causes for many of the epidemic of chronic disease that we see around the world. To me, the links between a healthy environment and healthy people, you know, it's it's pretty obvious, but then how those considerations for that relationship and, as you say, the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm in the healthcare sector. I mean, what does that actually look like today? And what are some of the common issues at hand today? I'll give you a little trajectory. I mean, when we started, there were 4,500 medical waste incinerators in the United States. Almost every hospital had one. Um, a decade later, there were less than 100 incinerators left. And we taught the hospitals how to reduce their waste, how to recycle their waste if they could, how to reuse materials, how to reprocess certain devices so they're not throwing them away after one use or non one use, and how to use alternative technologies like steam sterilization to address the small percentage, which is infectious waste, mm. save them lots of money. Yeah. Um, when we started uh, mercury thermometers, were the gold standard for measuring temperature. And 13 years later, we had won a global treaty facing mercury out of healthcare. So these were early wins to sort of show the sector that, A, you could you could address your climate footprint or your healthcare footprint, your environmental footprint at a scale that was meaningful, um, but that it was just the beginning. And then we said, okay, um, what about the plastics that you're using? Some of those plastics leach toxic chemicals into your patients. Yeah. From the PC plastics. Like, how could you be doing that to a kid in the neonatal intensive care unit or to a pregnant woman? They're already, you know, very exquisitely vulnerable at that point. Like, Makes no sense. Yeah. Look for safer alternatives. We looked at the buildings and said, look, the buildings, many of the buildings, the hospitals are made with toxic chemicals that off gas mm -hmm. into the environment yeah. or the furniture or the flooring. And so how do you detox the buildings and have more natural light? Use nature. Helps people feel better, you know, better lighting. So we worked on that. And then we said, what about the food you serve? A lot of the food is junk food. Sugar beverages, you know, fast food joints and lobbies of hospitals, you're actually contributing to the very diseases that you're trying to solve for. And you're modeling the wrong kind of a food environment. Mm -hmm. So we worked with them to try to start to get more local and sustainable food into their facilities, support more local farmers, diverse farmers, get rid of sugar sweetened beverages, have more plant based diets less meat, and the meat that they bought more sustainably grown, not through these CAFOs and industrialized production facilities. Um, and at some point, we said climate. Climate is going to be the greatest public health threat we face mm -hmm. on the planet, and healthcare is going to be the epicenter of responding to that crisis. So we looked at the, 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 the footprint of the healthcare sector globally, on its greenhouse gas emissions, and we found it was about 5% of, of global emissions, and that was the equivalent to so of over 500 coal-fired power plants every year. In the United States, it's almost 10% of U.S. emissions. 
So we said, okay, you got the healthcare sector has to model for the rest of society globally the transition away from our addiction to fossil fuels. So you need to decarbonize. Um, second, you in, in these climate disasters, which are now occurring more and more and faster and faster and with uh, greater ur urgency, in those times of crisis, healthcare hospitals are, are the epicenter of response. You're not even designed to be operative. Some, what we learned in, in, in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina is all, all the hospitals had to be evacuated because all the emergency equipment and the backup systems were in the basement and got mm -hmm. flooded. So how do we design for climate mm -hmm. change? And how do you understand who is vulnerable in your community? Who's on ventilators? Who's already got pre-existing conditions? Who's already um, got asthma because uh, of air pollution and need to be protected? Who's too old to get out when it's 110 degrees in Phoenix for 30 days? So understanding the vulnerability of, uh, and the health inequities that we already face, that's another dimension of that, you know, our response. And then the third is really about leadership, is that for decades, people have, when, they, when you say to people climate change, mm -hmm. they say, oh, that's, isn't that something to do with polar bears on, on melting ice caps? Mm -hmm. Isn't it something to do with like seeding glaciers? Yeah, it's not, it's not my house. It's not my community. I can't relate to that. It's something else. It's somewhere else. It's mm -hmm. down the road, it's not even my generation. Maybe my grandkids have to deal with this. But, um, you know, what we've now recognized is that, A, climate, the climate crisis is here. It's affecting everybody on the planet. Mm -hmm. And the more that we can help people understand it as a health crisis, it's more likely that people will care. And we can talk about addressing the climate crisis, but at the same time, we're going to improve people's health all over the planet. So health becomes a very powerful frame in which to talk about climate change, in which to get the healthcare sector engaged and get others educated and, and active. So we see those three things, sort of, sort of decarbonization, detox, community resilience, and advocacy as sort of fundamental roles that the health sector needs to play at this time of global existential threat. I mean, firstly, just this is such a large scale issue and, you know, you've developed a, like a three prong strategy focused on what you just touched on, mitigation, resilience and leadership. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. my question, I guess, is like, how do you hope to see these, um, you know, like, are there any trajectories that's going on that you hope to continue seeing or um, anything change or improve upon um, that the healthcare sector can do um, with respect to each of these in the coming years? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of momentum that we've been able to create with other partners around the world. Um, so, for example, we were um, chosen by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, their, their Climate Champions Program, to um, get um, healthcare systems to commit to the race to zero, to mm -hmm. sort of zero emissions, so that it's in alignment with the Paris Treaty. And we've got a very large network across 84 countries. And so we're able to get like almost 14, over 14,000 hospitals to commit to the race to zero oh, wow. um, across 30 countries or so. So it creates this huge cohort of hospitals mm -hmm. that are all traveling down the same road. I mean, how do they deal with their energy? How do they get rid of some of the anesthetic gases that are so potent as a greenhouse gas? How do they... Um, get rid of some of the single-use plastics and how do they deal with their food waste and how do they make their buildings more energy efficient and run on renewable energy. All those you know, interventions have got this huge cohort that's learning from each other and accelerating their, their success. Um, so that's happening. We, we worked with the United, um, with the World Health Organization and the British government to develop a health program for the a conference of parties that happened in Glasgow a couple of years ago, the climate treaty negotiations. And so um, that program essentially mimics what we've been talking about is getting basically low carbon resilient healthcare um, to be the norm on the mm -hmm. planet. And to this date now, 75 countries 
have signed on to this health program, whole countries and their health systems. So there's enormous momentum at a governmental public system level to move down this path. Uh, the other thing that's happened is that there's many now different health professional organizations that are basically waking up and recognizing, advocating for phase out, rapid, just phase out of fossil fuels as the core to this crisis. That this recognition that uh, fossil fuels are both a leading cause of air pollution deaths all around the world, mm. more of AIDS, malaria, and TB combined, mm. um, that the same uh, fossil fuel emissions are driving the climate crisis, and that the fossil fuel industries have, have actually poisoned our democracy as well um, by capturing whole political parties and governments around the world to prevent uh, action on climate change. There's more, uh, the last uh, conference of parties, there were more fossil fuel delegates than any country, any individual country. Yeah. So they've poisoned our bodies, they've poisoned the environment, and they've poisoned our democracy. So getting health professionals to 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 become advocates um, around policies that will force them to be accountable, this industry to be accountable, to pay for the damage that they already have caused uh, to people's health and the environment, and to enact a just transition. There's enormous momentum now that we couldn't have dreamed of before. Mm. So that's a good thing. And we need to keep building on that, obviously. And our sense is that it's not just the health sector that is on its own here, but the health sector needs to join the broader climate movement that's already alive and well mm -hmm. to add their voice, add their political clout, to add their purchasing clout, um, to drive the economy away from these destructive technologies. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, an, it's an intergenerational struggle. Um, and that's why we need many more young people like yourself and, and others who are going to continue to take up the mantle and, and win this effort over the next 20 and 30 years. It's absolutely mission critical for the future of humanity. Everything is truly so interconnected and you know like you touched upon how central community wellness is in that and I, I'd love to go into I guess like in your mind what have been some of the most effective like solutions or strategies that um, either this healthcare sector can Im uh, employ or other sectors can employ when it comes to in approaching and, and incorporating into its DNA as you say not only sustainability but resilience equity and that community wellness yeah. and I guess like you know, in your experience, are there any like stories that are memorable for you um, of of success? Yeah, I mean, there's there's many stories. Um, so, I'll just give a few examples at different scales. Um, in the San Francisco, Oakland Bay area, there's a number of hospital systems and university that are acting, starting to act as guaranteed buyers of more. Uh, local and sustainable and racially diverse um, farming, and so they're bring they're bringing those um, healthy foods um, to their hospital patients, to their employees, to the university students and and the school systems in the Bay Area, and so it it's both a it's both a kind of a climate resilient strategy because it's good to have agriculture that's close, that's proximate to your region instead of buying it from China or somewhere else yeah. or the far away places. Mm -hmm. So less climate miles, more sustainably grown and means less pesticides and it's healthier. So it's multi-solving for both building the local economy, solving for some of the climate impacts and actually improving people's health. So that's the, that's the kind of Example. Another example is um, there's a state in India called Chhattisgarh, and they made a commitment to solarize a thousand clinics. And so what it, what that does is multiple benefits. A, it gets them off of diesel fuel, so that's climate benefit from the mitigation side. It's a resilience measure because the grid in India is incredibly unstable. Mm -hmm. And there's hours every day and many months of the year where it doesn't even work at all. 
And so if you, you can run your facility on, on, on renewable energy, then you're also more resilient in the face of the community's needs. And what it's turning out is that because there is guaranteed electricity, you can deliver babies at night. You can do surgeries at night. You can refrigerate medicines. So it's a, it also is a, is a, a win for universal health care access. Yeah. So I think there's, there's examples of this all over the world that, that are popping up that need to be done at scale. So hospitals can, for example, invest in microgrids, uh, solar and battery storage, not just for their own facilities, but for the communities they serve. Um, so they can leverage their uh, economic cloud to actually build more resilient, more just, more sustainable economies in the regions that they operate. They can act as anchor institutions. They're not going to move away and move the whole thing to China because they're located in place. Mm -hmm. That's what's very powerful about yeah. healthcare is they're located in a place. They're identified with a place. They're supposed to take care of people in that place. Mm -hmm. And so what our, our strategy is, is to transform healthcare in the 21st century to recognize that we have to deal with healing at three levels. Individual healing, patients that come to our facilities who are sick and take care of them. Community healing, doing things that address the racial and health and economic disparities, the pollution, the housing, the food insecurities that actually made people sick in the first place. And planetary healing. Mm -hmm. And so this is the first generation of health professionals and health systems that are going to have to embed this DNA, local, individual, uh, community, and planetary healing. But every generation after this is going to have to do this work. Mm. Yeah. So we're piloting that for the future of healthcare. We're providing that direction, those cohorts, those other leaders and champions that are going to embed this, this new mission as planetary healers. Um, yeah. for the health that's what's called for you yeah and that only makes sense like um i mean i'd also i want to go into the conversation about scale um like you've mentioned earlier you now have you know global partnerships and a network based in over 80 countries um i mean i'm curious as to how you you know what advice do you have for like success successfully building and sustaining this kind of global collaboration and you know what qualities you believe, you know, are crucial for effective leadership and, you know, driving this movement forward? Mm -hmm. Well, um, giving people wins, making things possible. So we always said that if we're going to highlight a problem, mm -hmm. we also have to help provide the solution. Because at least in where, where we operate, people are very busy and mm -hmm. they don't have a lot of time. And so you need to say, okay, like on Mercury, okay, you, you have a problem. You're major polluters and you, and you have all these millions of Mercury thermometers that are breaking in your facilities. Um, there's safer alternatives to those. Here they are. Here's those mm -hmm. safer. And if you use those safer alternatives, then you don't have to do this expensive cleanup of Mercury in your hospitals. You don't have to have hazmat suits. You don't have to train people. Mm -hmm. It'll stick you money in the long term. And here, this is the second part. And there's others that have done it. So creating models of success so that mm -hmm. people can say, oh, I see that hospital over there, they did that. And that they had a success. Let's go talk to them. Mm -hmm. And so creating kind of um, innovation models that then can be scaled and then creating the network so that people can share with each other. I think that could happen in any different mm -hmm. sector, mm -hmm. in diversity, in any kind of industrial corporation sector, or in agriculture, just building a network, a platform where people can come and learn from each other and accelerate learning. And innovation can come from any quarter. Leadership can come from any seat, is what we say. Mm -hmm. um, those kind of things, giving people the, the tools, the success stories, the how-to guides, the community of practice, and then the inspiration. Say, hey, this is this is this is the highest resonance of what we can do. This is how you develop agency, given where you sit 
in the world. Here's how you are part of the solution. And so uh, all those are dimensions I think are really critical. And the other thing is I think uh, we need to really deal with people's mental and spiritual health. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, what I've seen uh, is that many young people especially feel enormous amount of despair around the climate crisis. Like, what can I do? Like, it's too late. And showing people examples, being part of the change itself is actually an antidote to despair. Being involved at whatever level, in your local school or town or university or business, whatever it is, being involved in the change itself is part of the antidote uh, to despair. And so we really try to pay attention to supporting people's um, emotional and spiritual health because it is challenging to live on this planet over 50 years. So sustainability tools for their own their own um, mental health, their own physical health, their own spiritual health. Mm-hmm. 100%. That's so well said. Um, and I mean, like you've you've previously touched on your own personal journey in terms of like you know, speaking about resisting the myth of the lone social entrepreneur and like the mental health pressures that came with that. And, you know, mm-hmm. for example, about scaling up and whatnot, you've since built those ecosystems and networks. And I guess, um, why is it important to have, you know, community and network be so central? And what are some, I guess, like either other challenges or, or lessons that you've had to learn or unlearn or whatnot over the years? Yeah. So I think, um, not seeing that you're alone is really, really crucial for anybody. You know, I mean, a lot what we learned, and we learned many times, but we learned a lot during COVID is if you're sitting at home alone, you're not connected to other people, it's really easy to get depressed, to feel hopeless. And so connection with people is just a, is a fundamental need that people have. And so... That's also true if you're a change agent. You're a, is that somehow believing that the world is on your shoulders alone is faulty thinking. Um, that so that getting with getting together with others and understanding that, like the individual hero that's going to change the world is not is not an operative strategy. Mm-hmm. Nor is even just an organization. An organization is important, and it's important to have organizations to to coalesce energy and focus. But even that's not enough. We need to build movements. And that's what we've been learning over this time period, is that we need to build movements of people that are in a broad ecosystem that all have different assets to bring to the party, to bring to the change. And that we need to get out of our silos to see that there are others who also care, but they're coming from a little different framework. They may be using different language. They have different interests, but they can be aligned with our interests. Um, And so that, all of those things I think are really key to to the future of our organizing efforts. Um, Loneliness is is a big challenge, I think. And... um, and I think that we have to work against it. We have to work against that and to help people um, to address that. The other reason why it's so important to think outside of our own silos is that these all these issues, as you say, are interconnected. So the threat to democracy by fascist thinking, by voter suppression, mm-hmm. uh, is very linked to our ability to solve for the climate crisis. If you have a whole political party that is in opposition to addressing the climate crisis because they're getting money from the fossil fuel industry, yeah. and they're the same set of people that are trying to pass voter suppression laws, we need to be linking up yeah. that democracy, defending democracy is crucial to uh, addressing the climate crisis. Mm-hmm. defending people of color who were many of them on the front lines of yeah. the worst abuses of this industry in, in places like Appalachia and Louisiana and India and China. Uh, that becomes part of our agenda. Um, 
So it's thinking really broadly and understanding that we need we can't we can't maybe put all our individual efforts on every topic. It's you go crazy, but building solidarity with others. Mm-hmm. We're doing those things. We're doing the voter uh, registration. We're stopping voter suppression. We're just, you know addressing racism. They're all part of the movement. You know, we're defending women and girls' rights. All part of the movement. Yeah. Yeah, no, that definitely resonates. Sometimes I find myself thinking, you know, like, is what I'm doing enough as as one single person? But it's not about that. We're all doing our own part of this, you know, huge interconnected issue, for sure. Um, Yeah, and, and, uh, you know, the media has not helped us. The media is looking for individual heroes that have mm-hmm. solved everything and saved the world. It's just not the way the world works. Um, yeah. And philanthropy hasn't helped often. <laughs> <You> know, they're <laughs> yeah. also looking for the lone hero. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just think it's not helpful. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you so much for highlighting that. Um, did you always like think that you would be doing what you do today? Not at all. Um <laughs> I was really interested in Indian philosophy. Mm-hmm. I spent a lot of time in India um, going to pilgrimage places and studying Buddhism with the Tibetan refugees. And I was thinking I was going to be, you know, um, focused on that, um, that kind of spiritual you know, pursuit or as an anthropologist or I wasn't sure what I was doing. Um, so... No, I didn't think that. But I was always just interested in ethics. Mm-hmm. And that's why when the Bhopal disaster happened, I thought, well, how can corporations get away with murder? What kind, of, what kind of civilization do we have where that that can happen and those corporations get away with it? Um, and so I was very motivated by that issue of accountability. Um, and then as I landed in the health sector, I thought, well, here's actually a sector that actually has an ethical framework. Yeah. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. How does it, you know, how does that work? How, what does do no harm mean in a world where uh, kids are being born with toxic chemicals on their bodies? What does yeah. do no harm mean in a world that where the climate crisis is, is going out of control, where the food system manufactures disease? It's a, it's a powerful Zen Kohan for the for the healthcare sector to say, well, if these are the new realities that people face around their health, we in the health sector, we need to do better. We need to em- embrace the Hippocratic Oath and what that means. And my view is that we need that do no harm as the as the mantra for the future economy on the planet. We can't be poisoning people along the, the supply chain and, and poisoning the environment. The whole the whole economic model that is based on fossil fuels and toxic chemicals have has been predicated on the idea of externalizing harm. Harm to the environment and harm to people and animals and other species. You can't have that on the planet. You can't have healthy people on a sick planet. And so Phasing out toxic chemicals and, and fossil fuels, which are the root calls, is actually the greatest public health intervention we can make on the planet. To me, that's 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 a global ethic. Yeah. Yeah. No, one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess like. What then for the future in terms of anyone who's, you know, looking to get into this movement and um, uh, be it in the environmental health field or just environmental advocacy in general, I guess, what's some advice or resources that you would recommend to them? Um, well, there's so much happening and just find your spot, you know, yeah. there's there's so many different organizations and there's so many um, different initiatives, whether it's around deforestation or 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 oceans or uh, farm, you know, agriculture or healthcare or my God, there's so many opportunities um, to get involved in any, and you know, every sector is awakening to this, um, either from a risk point of view or an opportunity point of view, um, and so uh, it's clear that this arena 
of transformation is going to define the future of civilization. And the more that we can build an integrated vision, the more that we can multi-solve and create a planet that's healthier for people. So just get involved, you know, wherever you find yourself. Find other people who you like and and work with them. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. At some level, of course, it, there is individual agency and action, um, and you want to be an, an element of that. I remember there was one woman um, at one hospital in Boston that said, yeah, we can get rid of mercury. We can educate our patients and our employees about why mercury is dangerous. Mm. And so she did it. That was the mm. first one. Then we built this whole network that was able to then scale that idea. So um, that individual action, very powerful, but it's way more powerful when she's part of a much broader yeah. ecosystem of actors. And so that's that's important, I think, to think about. Don't do it alone. Think, you know, yeah. Have friends. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that definitely resonated. And thank you so much for, for that advice. Um, I mean, this is also a question that I, you know, as we're winding down, um, like ask every episode, if you could um, turn back time, butterfly effects aside, and um, tell your younger self something that, you know, you've learned from life so far, what would you say to them? Follow your passion. You know, like I feel like I, I pretty much did that. Follow your passion. Follow the the your north your own north star, things that really really inspire you and motivate you, um, and trust in yourself to do that. Listen to your inner voice and do that, um, because you're going to be happier. You know wherever they, wherever that takes you, you're going to be a happier person. Take care of yourself. You know. Build your own resilience, your own wellness. There's tools out there now that are that weren't obvious when I was growing up. Tools around meditation, yoga, and emotional intelligence. You know, all those tools are out there now to support your own resilience and your own wellness. That's, that's crucial, crucial internal stuff to do. And then the third thing I'd say is be in community wherever they find yourself. Be in community, whether it's people around you that live in your neighborhood or some tribe of some whatever that, you know, some people that do the similar things that you like to do. Just build, and build community for yourself. So passion, personal wellness and resilience and community. That'll take you far so much for that yeah it's as much about environmental sustainability as it is you know personal sustainability so yeah they're they're, yeah. they're together mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. you, you can't you can't you can't sustain yourself on on outrage and anger yeah, yeah. Also. Mm -hmm. thank you so much for that um and again for what you do it's truly um it, it gives me a lot of I don't know. I really learned so much from this conversation. And um, I mean, for, for any listeners that, you know, want to learn more about your work or, I mean, get involved, um, where can they find you? Well, www.noharm.org. Um, and then there's some, a lot of the climate um, stuff that we have, a lot of climate tools and resources. Uh, at a site called, we have a physician network. We have tools to measure climate footprint of healthcare. I and mean, obviously that's our, lane but there's a lot of uh there's a lot of there's a lot of good resources there thank you so much um yeah and again learn so much from this thank you so much for taking another video here great we'll keep up to your great work Heidi it's important you're doing thank you so much